I don't personally like it being called communion. Uh, it's just a personal preference. You actually don't really see that in scripture. You, you, see, you see, well, we'll see the term here that's used this morning. So 1 Corinthians 11, uh, starting at verse 17. Okay, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. But there must also be heresies among you, that uh, they which are approved may be made manifest among you. Uh, when you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. So here's a term that we see this used uh, initially. Sorry. Uh, good morning. We're in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. So uh, we see the term here used. He says, uh, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. This, speaking of their, their coming together. For in eating everyone taketh before his own supper and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I, uh, or shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Okay, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. And then for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And then who's, and he's going to address a little bit more as far as the manner in which they're supposed to eat it. So uh, we see that term used actually here a little earlier in the passage uh, where he speaks of, in verse 20, that they're eating the Lord's Supper. They're eating the Lord's Supper. So that begs the question, okay, what is the Lord's Supper? Again, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but what is the Lord's Supper? He says this is it. But what, what actually was it? Yeah, okay, so it's Passover. It was their Passover dinner that they were celebrating. Um, okay, so it's Jesus' Passover meal with his disciples. It's a memorial of what Jesus did, or at that time, they had, he hadn't done it yet, but he was getting ready to do it, that uh, he was going to offer his body and his blood. And then, as well, it's, it's a command to be obeyed. So these are the three things, this our basic outline as far as today that we're going to be addressing that we're going to be looking at as far as what this is. So first off is Jesus' Passover meal. Jesus' Passover meal with him. Um, we're, well, go to Exodus then. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. We're getting ready to read it, but why was it Passover instituted? What was God's purpose for it? To spare the Israelites from death. Is there any other reason? It was pointing to Jesus in the future. Okay. He gives specific two reasons as to what it is, uh, why the Passover. Uh, beginning in verse 1, Exodus 12. And then it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you, the beginning of months, shall be the first month of the year to you. Okay, so now he's rearranging their calendar. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, ye shall take, uh, they shall take every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of, soul, of the souls, every man according to his eating. 
uh, shall make your count for the lamb. So you got to get one basically big enough to be able to feed everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, yes, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, mention here that this is if they had just celebrated Passover. They had just eaten the Passover lamb, and uh, they had the unleavened bread there. And then this is separate from the Passover because they've just eaten the Passover meal. Uh, in uh, First Corinthians. So he's using the bread, but he's not using the the, the lamb. Yes. Yes. <coughs> yeah. That we're going to make that distinction later on. But he does. He did. Yeah. That is a good point. Um, you're going to see the. I'm going to correlate the two. Because basically they had gathered. We go to. Well, we'll go to Matthew in a bit. But also in Matthew 26, you see that Jesus commands his disciples to go ahead and ask a man in town to see whether we can use his upper room. Uh, he actually doesn't use the term upper room, but he's gonna, if we can use his room, there's a room that we can use at his household for them to be able to go ahead and eat their Passover. So then he, they make that arrangement, they go to eat the Passover, they're gathered together, and then uh, it's during, after the course of the meal that he takes the bread, which is unleavened, uh, which is commanded for Passover, and then also uh, we don't see this element mentioned at all anywhere in it, but as far as he takes the, the wine, which we'll see is fruit of the vine, it's unleavened, it would have to be unleavened. Mm -hmm. considering what we're going to read here as far as Passover. And then he takes and he, he makes that, uh, he, he makes it as far as, okay, okay, this is to be my body, the unleavened bread, and then the wine is supposed to be my blood, and then this do in remembrance of me. So that's a, the distinction. You have those two elements, so even though the unleavened bread is part of uh, Passover, but it would have been, after, yes, it would have been after the meal. Um, okay, so... Uh, verse 5, okay, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Uh, so you basically take care of it, uh, taking care of it, feeding it. And then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Okay, they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night. Note, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herb shall they eat it. Okay, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast it with fire, his head and his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. Now that's kind of a weird word, but basically with the innards. You don't, they eat it in it with everything, which is kind of different. It's like, okay, you would figure you would want to gut the thing, and it, like, it's like, okay, you, the pertinence, the, the inside. Um, and then ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And then thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on, your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay, so this is another, as far as the manner you're supposed to eat it. Okay, for I will pass through, now he's got to explain why. Verse 12, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Okay, so this is the first main reason, as far as we see, why Passover was instituted by God. Okay, Passover was instituted by God as a feast to be kept through all generations. Uh, well, if we were to skip down to the end of it, we'll see that that's what he did. He says, okay, you're supposed to keep it. Um, Interesting in verse 14, this day to you, sh this day shall be to you for a memorial, you shall keep it, a feast to the Lord throughout all your generations. It's a memorial, yeah. and so is the Lord's Supper. Yes. <laughs> That's part of the things that we see I never correlated. Said it before. Me neither, honestly. It wasn't until I'm reading this, I was like, wow, okay, there's a lot correlated. The only thing is, is that you don't have... You only have one of the many elements that are used, the unleavened bread. Yeah. But it doesn't mention anything about the wine, or it doesn't mention anything about the, the lamb or the bitter herbs, but uh, it, for Lord's Supper. So it was, it's, it's meant as a memorial, and then it commemorates God's judgment on Egypt, killing all the firstborn. So that we see that, he said specifically here, verse 12, that I, he's going to execute judgment. So <coughs> remember... God executing judgment on Egypt. Now, why would that be the case? Well, it's because they were pagan. And in particular, they were uh, 
rebelling against God. Uh, they were holding his people hostage. Uh, any number of things. And the fact is they were just flaunting in the face of God. Hey, look, Pharaoh best encapsulated their attitude towards God, which was, I am, who's the Lord? You know, I'm God. Kind of By thing. the way, that picture's got an error in it. Uh, the blood should be on the lintel and the side posts not on the stone. Oh, the stone, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pick up on that. I just thought it looked cool. Uh, That's what I uh, pick a lot of pictures. I get it. I, thank you. I'll have to change it for, for the next one. Okay, and then it also commemorates God's liberating Israel from Egypt, which would have been pending at the time, because at the time they were still in bondage, and he would liberate them. Um, I just thought it would be cool because it's way further along in the story as far as where they're liberated, at the point where they're crossing the Red Sea. Uh, we see that here as well. Um, Well, we'll start at verse 15. A seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that shoal shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in, the, in them, save that which every man must eat, uh, that only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread now, wait a minute, he just switched what's this unleavened bread. It's the same thing. It's the same holiday. Except the only thing is the unleavened bread portion is extended seven days. So now you have on the 10th, from the 10th to the 14th, you take your lamb and then you groom it. You kill it on the evening of the 14th and then you cook it. Uh, roast with fire, with the bitter herbs, and then you eat of it. Uh, don't leave it anything for the next morning. You eat your bread unleavened. And then in particular here, the unleavened portion of it, it lasts seven days, and then there's supposed to be no leaven whatsoever in basically anything. You're not supposed to have it in your household. Um, and, you know, verse 17, you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in the selfsame day I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Okay, so that's where it's commemorating the fact that he's liberating them. Or he's, well, at this point, he's speaking in past tense, but where are they? He hasn't even passed over them yet. So this is still, well, uh, they're pending God's judgment coming on Egypt and pending his liberating them and all that. So they're looking to them by faith as far as what he's going to do. He's giving him promise as far as what I'm going to do for you. So it's commemorating two things, God's judgment and then also his liberating them. And they're supposed to keep it uh, basically in your generations uh, by an ordinance forever. So it's a memorial to them, and it's an ordinance for them to keep that. Okay, the Lord's Supper. Now, uh, I know this is jumping ahead, but the Lord's Supper. We read in first. Well, we read First Corinthians eleven that um, Paul received the same thing, and then that he's telling them, the church at Corinth, in that self same night that Jesus he took the bread. And he, break, he blessed the break, and he said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And we see that institute. Go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. So Matthew 26? Yes, sir. Matthew 26. Uh, starting at verse 17. It says, Now, the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house and with my disciples. The disciples said to Jesus, um, Did as... Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now when even was come, he sat with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, one, shall, one of you shall betray me. And then they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? 
And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. And the Son of Man goeth, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man had he not been born. And then we see about Judas. And then uh, verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink of it, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then when they had sung in him, they went on to the Mount of Olives. So as they're eating Passover, he adds something a little different. Um, I mean, obviously, unleavened bread would have been part of Passover. They'd be eating the lamb. And then now as they're finishing, he takes a, of the bread that they would have already been eating. And he says, okay, take eat. He blesses it, breaks it. This is my body that is broken for you. And then he takes of what they're drinking, which is fruit of the vine. And then he says, okay, you know, this is... Um, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So he instituted this aspect of it for Passover uh, at this point in time. Uh, we see that again reiterated in 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, commemorate his sacrifice for our sin. Okay, uh, We see that again from 1 Corinthians 11. Okay, Obviously he hadn't died yet, but he was going to. He's getting ready to go to the cross. Uh, Judas was going to betray him. Uh, he would be taken. He would uh, go before council, uh, he would be beaten, uh, he would be scourged, uh, and all the great suffering that he endured, and then he would be actually crucified, lifted up, and then what we would read about in Matthew 27, and then the other the other synoptic Gospels. But it commemorates a sacrifice for our sin, in particular, uh, that his body would be broken, and that's what the matzah, or the bread, the unleavened bread, is supposed to be. Um, that we see, uh, you can't really see the red dot here, but a lot of that, um, just the, the way it's broken and then the way the matzah is laid out, you have the stripes, um, he was bruised for our iniquities uh, by the chastisement. Uh, by his chastisement, we, you know, we receive peace, uh, basically Isaiah 53. And then also, as well as that his blood would be shed. Okay, but he mentions that this, the, the cup, this cup is uh, my New Testament for the blood that he's going to shed. Okay, and that's, you know, for payment for our sin. Okay, now the elements in particular. Here's where I make the distinction. Okay, Passover, we have a male lamb of the first year without blemish. And that's uh, what we have as well. Okay, it's supposed to be roasted with fire, eaten with bitter herbs, and then unleavened bread as well. There's no mention of the other things. Um, the only reason I didn't put like a Passover Seder uh, in particular is just, you don't really have a description other than just, you have the lamb, the bitter herbs, unleavened bread. It must be a Mexican. They've got cilantro there. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And a tortilla. <laughs> Is that another bread? It's supposed to be. <laughs> That's a, it's supposed pita. to be pita. Yeah. Basically, like pita. What's the meaning of having on that? Uh, well, leaven is supposed <laughs> to represent sin. Okay, so it's supposed to be unleavened without sin. And then also, the, part of the fact is, I don't know how much this is true, but uh, from some of my reading, is that leaven takes time you, you like yeast you put it in bread yeah. uh, in your dough really you have to let it have time to rise or whatnot but because it's commemorating the fact that okay you're eating with your shoes on you're eating as if basically you're in a rush because of what God's going to do he's going to pass over and also the fact that he's getting ready to liberate you and once that Passover happens judgment falls on Egypt um, we're to read as far as like uh, Pharaoh calls for Moses, says, get out of here. Take your people, get out of here. And then he gives up the riches and is like, just I want you guys out of here. So that aspect of the fact, okay, God's liberating. Um, 
you're not going to have time to be able to go ahead and mix. But in particular, I think it has more to do with the fact that leaven represents sin. Uh, is there supposed to be a picture of sin? And so he is, is without sin, without blemish. And that, that's why I say also as far as, he mentions that term here in Matthew, fruit of the vine, so we know it's, the word wine is interchangeably used as far as whether it can be alcoholic or not, but like you specifically have where it's, if it's going to be alcoholic, strong drink that's used. But we know for a fact, okay, one, Jesus would have endorsed that because uh, he speaks against it, but also the fact that the other aspect of Passover is without leaven. So why would you have leaven in your drink if it's supposed to? Uh, I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, you're going to have, if you're going to have leaven in the drink, but not in the bread, that's just... leaven means false doctrine. Yeah. I know some people just do it traditionally without thinking, or just yeah. maybe out of bad theology, but... Yeah, it's, as far as the leaven in the drink, uh, that would be a fermented wine. Yeah. And one of the reasons we don't use fermented wine is that Jesus' blood was pure. pure. It was God's blood, and it was without sin. Amen. Yeah. That's right. So I don't, yeah, I don't think he would have used that. Okay, now with regard to Lord's Supper, the elements, you have unleavened bread and then unleavened fruit of the vine. Uh, that's where I make the distinction of it here. So we don't have the same as far as like bitter herbs and a lamb, even though that'd be pretty tasty, I think. But uh, it's commemorating in particular that his body would be broken in and also as far as that his blood would be shed. So that aspect of Passover is brought out uh, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And again, it's, it's commemorating. Um, well, <laughs> I was tempted to do this, but like, no, nah, it's not. It, would be, it, just, it wouldn't be right, but like, uh, there's three teachings that are out there with regard to the elements themselves. Uh, big fancy terms, one is uh, transubstantiation, another one is consubstantiation, and that is basically that the body of Jesus, when you eat the bread, when you bless it, uh, the unleavened bread, that uh, as far as Catholic teaching is that, that actually becomes the body of Christ. So it's like you're a cannibal, you know? So I would, I would have put up a picture of like a zombie eating a man or something like that. And then you got that the element the, the, the fruit of the vine that you'd be drinking becomes his blood. So uh, that's not what Jesus was saying as far as, okay, you've got to eat my body and drink my blood. Uh, you know, he's not trying to make the zombies or vampires. But he uh, is, it's just a memorial. It's a picture of the fact, okay, this, this is supposed to represent what he's doing and that he would die. He would have his body broken for us and then and blood would be shed. And again, it was all for the payment of our sin. Uh, and then the consubstantiation, that's kind of like a Lutheran adjustment, and that is that it spiritually becomes that. But really, in reality, it's just a picture of the fact. It's not, it's just commemorating. It's just a memorial of, again, what Jesus did. That it, his body was broken and his blood was shed for our sin. So commemorating the death, but looking forward to the resurrection. Now, in particular, when we celebrate Lord's Supper, and really, this is what it is. It's commemorating his death. Now, we know from reading scripture, and actually they would have had to, they would have had a uh, promise of the fact, because he told them specifically that in three days he would rise, so he's coming again. But we're particularly commemorating his payment, that aspect alone. Uh, we do obviously celebrate three days after Passover, uh, his resurrection, as the same, on the first day of the week. Uh, and in fact, actually, Every first day of the week that we worship really is commemoration of the fact that, hey, Jesus rose. We have new life. Uh, we, we, have, we also celebrate his, his second coming because yes. in 1 Corinthians it says, uh, we'll, we do show the Lord's death till he till come. come. Till he come. That's right. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, and so the fact is, Christ is coming again, so we have hope. Okay. Uh, it's not just that, okay, we die, we go to the grave, but you know, we're going to be in heaven. And as well as a, you know, all the other promises that he has fulfilled, or that he has yet to fulfill with regard to the fact that he's going to reign and rule. We'll be reigning and ruling with him here. And all yet to, that's pending with regard to Israel. So commemorating the death, but looking forward, but in particularly focusing, 
focusing on the death, and then uh, this do in remembrance of me. All right, does anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any questions with regard to the Lord's Supper? What's that? Oh, um, he doesn't specify as far as frequency. Go to 1 Corinthians 11. He just says as often as you do. So that's subject to mm -hmm. God's leading. Yes, sir. We had a big discussion about that in the previous church we were in in Fort Worth. And the previous pastor had determined that we were only going to celebrate it on Passover, just once a year. And so when the new pastor came, I, I, I started talking with Brother Engelman about this, and I said, you know, it doesn't say as seldom as you eat this, it says as often as you eat this. I'm not saying we should do it every month, every week, like the people, like they apparently did in the first century church, yeah. but we at least ought, ought to do it often. Yes. And that, that's, uh, I don't want to be dogmatic about it, and I wasn't then, but he, we actually decided to do it on the, the first uh I think the first Sunday of every month after that. But that's that's up to the local church, but it's it shouldn't be seldom. That's right. Um, the wording on it is pretty clear as far as like as often. So and then we see the pattern as Brother uh, John mentioned that uh, you go through Acts starting in Acts two uh, forward that they would continually meet, and that was at the first day of the week they would they would they would celebrate it every every Lord's Day. Uh, they would have the breaking of bread, and that's referencing in particular Lord's Supper. So they did Lord's Supper weekly, uh, and then actually they met daily. Uh, the church met daily, but they would have celebrated Lord's Supper weekly. Um, there's something in regard to oh, that was another aspect that I want to bring out. That thank you. Um, First Corinthians 11, he addresses the manner in which we're supposed to eat it. And that would be as far as our spiritual condition. In other words, we would, obviously it would have to be somebody that would be born again uh, that would be f able to participate in it. Sir? Yes? Yeah, sorry, but uh, supposing somebody, it's like the Bible goes on to say here, that if he did be here to drink it unmorally, bring it, but bring it to himself damnation, what exactly does that mean? That when the person's not a believer? No, uh, you eat of it in an unworthy manner. In particular, well, we'll go. Your life over that, right? Is that what this passage is saying? Yeah, because he mentions that there are some that are sickly and then uh, some that sleep. So, believers sleep. So, in other words, there were there were believers already participating in this, but they were participating in it in a manner that wasn't worthy of what the commemoration. What is damnation there? Being? Uh, judgment. Basically, you bring upon yourself judgment. It's not that you lose your salvation, you lose your soul, but rather, you know, God could give you sickness, God could kill you before your time because of, as judgment on the fact that, hey, you are doing something that's on. So that person should just not participate. Yeah, or get right. You, that is an option, too. That's actually the call to it. He wants us all to participate in it. Uh, but First Corinthians 11. Uh, verse 17, it says, Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. First of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Okay, so first off, they're divided. They have strife amongst themselves. And he mentions the word heresies, that you know it must be necessary that they have heresies. So the idea of heresy is basically like a division, divisiveness. Okay, so there's contention among the believers that are there. And they're gathered together to, in particular he's referencing that they're gathering together for the Lord's Supper. They're gathering together for worship of the Lord, but also in particular for the Lord's Supper, and that there's still divisions among them. So it's like, hey, you're not... That's part of the manner that's unworthy. You got issues with other people that you haven't gotten corrected. How, what does Jesus say about that? Yeah, you, you, you come to your brother first. You deal with that. You know, you leave your gift at the altar instead of coming and trying to bring a sacrifice to God. Uh, 
and to worship God, but if you have issue with your brethren, you you know, you need to first address the issue with your brethren first to be able to have a clear conscience and have get right with God. Um, so you know, get get right get right with people. So that was part of the, what was in the other word. Yes. That that means forgiving others who sin against you, or like if you're in a church that decides they're going to ordain women as pastors and you disagree, you don't think it's right. Is that being divisive? If they yes, believe in Jesus huh. and, and, and this, is that something that is a divisive thing? Or is it yeah, right okay. Just... This is going to sound weird, but yes and no. Yes, it's divisive because the fact is it's, but it's right. In other words, you're, if you are standing on truth and somebody's in error, there's going to be a division there. Okay, so that's necessary. But the thing is, that's a good division. That's not a bad division. In other words, you are made aware of truth that, hey, wait a minute, this is wrong, this is sin, and I need to stand with right if I'm going to be right. In other words, I need to align myself with what's right if I'm going to maintain a relationship with God. If somebody's going in error with that, they're going to divide, they're going to want to separate from you with regard to that. Or they're going to want to get you to go in along with their error. Um, and if you're going to stay right with God, then you have to stand with and align yourself with what's right. So there is, and technically in that sense, yeah, okay, that is division, that's, but that's right. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Okay, so that's not, that's not a bad thing. Even though that would bring, you know, tension and all the other aspects of it. Um, the negative aspect would be that you are in wrong and then you're trying to coerce people to go into wrong with you, you know. Uh, that's a lot more of what you see, but the fact is that is that is equally division, okay? If but that that's correct. That, what's that? If that were the case. Yeah. 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 yeah, I, yeah but I that would be a good, that would be good division, not bad. I decided to leave my last church because of that and speaking to them, even going to the scriptures, I couldn't agree with them. But I feel so terrible that I went there for 10 years and then I had to leave like that. It still bothers me. But I mean, I, I, I can understand as far as you got relationships with people and then they're still, you know, you love them in the Lord. If they're born again, it's like, hey, they're still brethren, but you'd hate to see somebody in error. You know, you want them to come around to, hey, this is truth. But you can't, if you are going to be right with God, you have to align yourself with what's right, with, with truth. And that, that's going to require at times that separation and division. We're actually going to address that. <coughs> I'm sorry. The warning for the Lord's Supper isn't that, you know, you're in agreement with everyone about everything. It's that there's nothing, no, no sin between you and God, between you and another person. So you may disagree with another person, but as long as you haven't wronged them and not confessed that, then gotten that right with them, or you know, harbored a bad attitude toward them, or something like that. So it's it's making sure that you know you don't have any sin in your life, that you're you have the right attitude, then you're right with God and with other believers, whether they agree with you or not. As long as you know that you are right with God and have, have mm -hmm. done the right thing, that's what it's saying. It's trying it's trying to make sure that you know when when you take of the Lord's Supper service that you know. You're 100% correct, God, at that point in time. There's a time to stand and fight, and there's a time to leave. Yeah. The first church I visited when I came to, to uh, the Fort Lauderdale area was, uh, I won't mention the name of it, but they were using the NIV, and it went on a Wednesday night, and they were encouraging me to come back. I said, well, I think I don't think I should because I wouldn't want to get into a fight with you about the King James Bible, which I believe very strongly in. And I just left with that. I wasn't going to... You can't, you can't just stay and argue. You're not, gonna, you're not going to influence anybody that way. So there's a time when you have to leave, but there's a time when, uh, let's just say our church decided to, to bring in some music that wasn't right or, or you know, to use alternate scriptures. <laughs> you know, we, we ought to fight that. Yeah, that's true. <coughs> there's, a lot, there's actually a lot with regard to that. Mm -hmm. that um, the next lesson that we're going to see on as far as separation I'll deal with that specifically 
in as many of the aspects of that as the, you know whatever we can. And the Holy Spirit will lead you on that. True. That's a good point. Yes. There's also an element of growth here because so um, as a believer, you know, you may not understand everything that God wants you to do or, you know, the right things to do in every situation. And you may actually be doing something wrong but not knowing it. Not knowing that, oh, the Bible actually says something about this that we need to do it this way. And so I, I don't think God, I mean, if, if it's because you are, you know, not studying the scripture or not, you know, trying to find out what God wants you to do, then I think, yeah, God is going to hold you accountable for that. But if you, if you're trying to find it out, and then, and then you, you know, you discover when I, oh, look, God says to do this. I think that's when He's going to hold you accountable for that thing that you're reading. Oh, you know, now, now you know it. Now you, now you have to make sure you are following it. Yes. Good points. Good points. Um. Any questions or comments? All right, so next week we're looking at the final and its separation. And it's gonna, I'm going to probably break it up into three three lessons, even though you can probably just get it all done in one. We'll be looking at personal, ecclesiastical, and then civil, uh, just how that breaks down. And then it's just the easiest way for me to do it, I think. Personal, obviously, is pretty self uh, Actually, they're all self-explanatory, I think. Uh, so no questions, no more comments, we're dismissed. Mm. Well presented, thank you. Thank you, your production quality is just like skyrocketing. <laughs> <laughs>